Hey everybody, Trey here. Welcome back to another video. We've had quite a bit of interesting weather across the Arizona deserts today. We've had a number of severe thunderstorms, including a few supercells and one that produced a tornado warning well to the south of the Phoenix metro area, south of the town of Eloy. Um, so I thought it'd be a perfect time to do a little meteorological breakdown of this event. Um, it's going to be just a down and dirty breakdown. I don't have a lot of stuff prepared. Just thought this was a real interesting case and wanted to do a little brief discussion on the kind of the environment that surrounded this event that allowed this event to happen, as well as kind of the progression of the storm itself, uh, what I was looking at on radar, and some of the things that led to the tornado warning process here. So again, this was a pretty rare event for the Arizona deserts. Very interesting setup. This storm, uh, this is what it looked like here. This was from uh, storm chaser Michael Binsky, who was out there. Just a beautiful looking storm, very Plains-esque looking storm here. Um, you can see some tilt in the updraft there, nice wall cloud in this rotating storm. And this was what it looked like kind of at its peak, very healthy looking wall cloud there underneath that uh, base. So definitely a well-developed supercell there uh, that uh, spawned this tornado warning. So let's go ahead and get started here. Let's look, first thing that I noticed here was that this storm emanated from a left split. So you can see here, um, this is our storm of interest here to the east of Santa Rosa, uh, about 3.15 p.m. Mountain Standard Time here. And you can see it's one storm here, and then as we go forward, it splits into two different storms. We have our left split right here and our right split right there. Now, if you've followed along here previously, and if you know a little bit about severe storms meteorology, you know that the right split tends to be the one that takes off. Uh, if you're talking about a plane setup, it's often going to be that right split that you know eventually turns to the right and has a greater chance of producing significant severe weather, including tornadoes. Whereas the left split often goes off um, in environments, in, in certain severe weather environments, and it just kind of dies, produces some large hail, but the tornado threat is pretty minimal. Um, and it eventually kind of fizzles out while the right one, right split takes over. Well, this was not the case here. You can, if we watch this this radar image here, you can take, keep an eye on that left split there. You can, you can see that, that that is the storm that takes over. It's the left split here. So this is kind of an unusual s scenario um, for a you know tornadic sort of thunderstorm. Usually it's going to be the right split that takes over. And so why is it that the left split uh, took over in this case? Well, here is our VWP, our vertical wind profiler from Phoenix. Um, right about the time is, that this storm was, was ongoing, as the tornado warning was in progress. Take a look at this photograph here. A very wonky looking photograph here, and it, it's a little bit difficult to decipher the overall um, sort of curvature in the photograph. Not a ton of deep layer wind shear here, meaning the photograph's kind of, uh, kind of just piled on top of itself here. You can see all these different um, levels of the atmosphere kind of piled on top of each other. Not, we don't really have that long, uh, large, long looping photograph that we often see in tornadic events. And you can see here a little bit of negative curvature, here, a little bit of wonky curvature here um, in the lowest levels. Well, what that's gonna do, you can see here that the SRH from zero to 500 meters is at two, it's basically zero. And anything negative, negative SRH is going to favor your left split storms, meaning that the left split is going to take over more so than the right split storm. And that's kind of what we see here. We see a little bit of a negative, maybe a negative component to the um, uh, the low level storm relative helicity here, uh, perhaps indicating that the left splits were going to take over today. Now, for the most part, storms kind of remained messy. I don't have the background sort of storm, uh, background radar here. Actually, let me pull up the current radar here and take a look. So this is the Tucson radar here. Let's see if we can go back a little bit. So you can see here, this is, of course, as kind of the storms are winding down. Um, so we don't have the storms kind of at their peak here, but notice how kind of messy these are. And this was how it was kind of all day. We had just mostly a mess here as across far southeast Arizona. Very clustered sort of storm, storm mode. And this western storm was the only storm that really was able to kind of remain in an isolated fashion. And so uh, we were able to get kind of our supercell, legit supercell characteristics out of this storm. And because of that kind of negative influence from the low level SRH, negative comp, uh, contribution of the SRH, the left split was able to take over in this case. 
rather than the right split, which is typical. A couple of other things now about the radar presentation and the tornado warning. So you can see here, nice, well-developed supercell, kind of that flying eagle shape with the core there. The pinks and purples indicate very strong reflectivity, perhaps some large hail falling. And that is confirmed by this nice, well-defined three-body scatter spike here. And it's this three-body scatter spike occurs, and it tells us that there's copious amounts of hail falling, generally large hail. So what happens with a three-body scatter spike is your radar, which in this case is going to be back this way. Tucson is back this way. So the radar beam is going to shoot at the storm. It hits the storm and hits all this large hail. And the energy from the radar beam is then reflect, deflected down toward the ground, then back up, and then back to the radar. And what the result of that is this three-body scatter spike, this little erroneous sort of uh, signature here that occurs kind of um, directly on the line of the radar beam um, between the radar beam and the, and the storm. It kind of shoots out, it looks like it's shooting out the backside here. This is, we know that this is not a meteorological scatterer of any sort. This is just an erroneous sort of uh, signature that we call the three body scatter spike. Again, it signifies that there's large hail, usually copious amounts of hail falling within the storm. Another thing here is as far as the decision to issue the tornado warning. Um, so if we look at our typical sort of supercell sort of schematic here, we know that we have in, you know, generally when we have kind of southwest flow aloft, the precipitation is going to be vented off toward the northeast. And you're going to have your hook echo kind of on the southwest side of the supercell, the southwest flank of the supercell here. And so looking at that location, it's going to be somewhere kind of in this area right in here. And we don't really see any sort of tight rotation here. Maybe some very broad rotation. As we know, reds are going away from the radar. Greens are going toward the radar here. So maybe some very broad rotation here in the low levels. And this is looking from the Tucson radar. So we are a little bit of a distance away from the storm itself. But I would expect to see a little bit stronger rotation here where that hook is kind of located if there was a tornado imminent. We definitely did see some rotation aloft with this storm. You can see, again, the radar is down sort of back in here. It's kind of off screen here. But to the southeast of the storm, you can see broad area of outbounds here, broad area of inbounds. So there was definitely some broad rotation aloft here. This is at the 1.2 degree elevation angle tilt three here. So um, there was some rotation aloft, but not a ton near the surface with this storm. Now this, to the untrained eye, might be a little bit troublesome here. This is likely what we call side lobe contamination. And it's a little bit difficult to explain here, but basically what happens is the radar beam is electromagnetic radiation. And think of it as a water gun. You have your main sort of lobe, which is the main kind of radar beam, the main source of energy, the main sort of stream of water that flows out of the gun. But say the, the end of the gun's a little bit frayed, and you're going to get these little sort of side lobes, these little sort of streams, these weaker sort of streams on the outer edges of the main lobe, and these are called side lobes. And when we have you know, strong reflectivity gradients, usually lots of large hail falling, copious amounts of large hail falling within a storm, or just in general sort of strong reflectivity gradients, like we do, we have here. You can see not much reflectivity over here. We go quickly to very strong reflectivity toward that core within the storm. The side lobes can generally, can sometimes have more power return than the main lobe. And we get these sort of erroneous sort of signatures, these kind of weak reflectivity signatures here. And this again is kind of part of that three body scatter spike, but it's a decent example here. So looking where this is, it's kind of right in here. And this, to the untrained eye, might look like a tornadic vortex signature, when it's actually not. This is most likely side lobe contamination. And one of the ways, also, you can tell that this is a fake couplet. Usually, tornadic couplets, so if you have your radar shooting out a radar beam into the storm, um, you're going to have what we call radials. So basically it's kind of, think of it as a graph. Uh, the grid, the beam is going to follow here. Usually a tornadic velocity couplet is going to is going to be right up against this one of these radials here. 
So for example, you're going to have reds all on one side of the radar and greens completely confined on the, the opposite side, right on the other side of the radial. And you're, it's going to be split in, in the middle by that radial. Well, we don't really see that here. We see that it's kind of, this would be kind of our radial here. We have reds kind of over here, greens kind of over here. So this is not a tight velocity signature. This is a fake TBS, if you will. Again, most likely side lobe contamination here. So I wonder if the tornado warning was issued on this fact because low level rotation didn't really look all that strong in the you know, correct location that it should be. Obviously, the Weather Service in Tucson felt there was enough evidence to issue a tornado warning. That's why I'm not working at the NWS, and that's why those people are the, uh, the smart people behind the desk there doing the warnings. Uh, they know better than, than the general public does. So, you know, not at all faulting them for issuing the tornado warning here. This was a, definitely a dangerous storm. Um, just was an interesting sort of velocity presentation here. I never really tightened that low-level rotation. Did have that nice stout wall cloud um, so that was rotating as reported by storm spotters. So uh, definitely was a rotating supercell. And uh, the um, surface, uh, uh, the you know, overall environment was not all that unfriendly um, as far as tornadoes go. Of course, we saw the kind of photograph here, very, very wonky, not to your kind of, you know, large looping photographs, low level photographs for tornadoes that we usually see. But things can happen in Arizona. Wonky things can happen in Arizona. Um, you know, terrain could have played a factor here. Lots of different mountains um, here um, with little valleys in between that could have played a role. Um, so you never know. Terrain is often an overlooked aspect of, of severe storm meteorology in Arizona. So let's go ahead and take a look here, kind of rounding things out at the overall environment for this setup here. So we'll start at 300 millibars, a little bit easier to see here. That's why I'm starting at 300 millibars instead of our usual 500 millibars here. Of course, we're doing this at 6.38 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, a couple hours after this storm, but this is going to give us the overall kind of broad picture of the environment here. Nice upper level trough here. Um, pivoting into the desert southwest, a little bit of enhanced flow, and defluence aloft. We talk about defluence a lot here on this channel. It's when the, the winds aloft kind of separate, um, and you get kind of this void aloft. And what happens when you have a void aloft? Well, the atmosphere wants to fill that void and bring air from below up to fill that void. And as a result, we get rising motion. And you need rising motion for storms. So you can see nice, very nice defluence here across much of south central Arizona um, here at 300 millibars. Very nice looking trough here. It's interesting kind of um, situation here with this trough. This is at 500 millibars, much, much weaker sort of depiction here. You can see in the wind barbs that we do have that kind of southwesterly flow, that kind of northerly flow transitioning to south uh, westerly flow here across Arizona. 500 millibar flow upwards of about 30 knots here. That's pretty strong for the monsoon season. We do have this nice little trough here. Now, it's kind of a question whether this was the remnants of K or some uh, of former Hurricane K uh, or some sort of other uh, trough influence. And I think it's a mix of both. We do see kind of cold temperatures here aloft, minus 8 to minus 9 degrees Celsius here across the lower deserts of, of southern Arizona. It's fairly cold air aloft, and we don't really see that with tropical systems. The air aloft is going to be much, much warmer. They're what we call warm core systems, whereas a typical trough like this one here across the eastern U.S. is going to be more of a cold core type system. We have colder air aloft. This one, I think, is going to be the remnants of that trop uh, Hurricane K. Um, so that has since, of course, dissipated and moved inland and kind of merged with this, this sort of large-scale troughing feature here across the western uh, portion of the U.S., across the west coast. So I think it's it's a combination of both here, but nonetheless we have we do have a nice looking trough here um, to help us with the storms here. And you can see at 700 millibars we do have a little bit more of a confined circulation here off the so Southern California, Baja California coast here. That may be the actual remnants remnants of K getting kind of absorbed into this sort of broader scale troughing feature. And this is a very, very interesting setup for Arizona. Once again, let's show our, our surface map here. Um, 
91 over 64. This was taken about 4.30 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, so as that storm was ongoing. 91 over 64, 93 over 66 here just to the south of Phoenix. So not all that terrible as far as temperature dew point spreads for um, tornadic supercells. Um, this is actually quite high moisture content for this time of year. Uh, upper mid 60s dew points is very, very high. I think it is some influence from K, some of that leftover moisture from Hurricane K making its way into Arizona along with that kind of southerly, southerly flow pushing that moist flow up uh, from western Mexico. And this is what we call a transition type setup. There are kind of four main types of severe weather uh, setups during the monsoon season in Arizona. And this is going to be type four. This is when we have, obviously, we know that in the monsoon, of, oftentimes the high is going to set up here, and you'll have broad sort of high pressure there, bringing these little disturbances around the base of this high, pulling up moisture into south central Arizona, and that's how you get storms here. This is more of your plains type severe weather kind of case. This is where we have leftover moisture, leftover monsoon moisture here. In this case, it come, it's coming kind of from Hurricane K, from Gulf of California. And you have start to have these sort of large scale weather systems, these low pressure systems, these troughs aloft that act on that moisture to help initiate severe thunderstorms. Often our most um, potent severe weather outbreaks, tornado outbreaks, um, in Arizona occur with this type four transitional thunderstorm pattern. That's kind of exactly what we're doing, what we're seeing here. Now, oftentimes the trough is going to be a lot stronger. Again, we didn't really see a, a really strong trough, but definitely some semblance of troughiness here um, impinging on that very unseasonably high, that seasonably high moisture across uh, south central Arizona to produce this severe thunderstorm uh, setup. Now, if you were, were to look at the morning soundings, you would, you would see that it looked, it looked actually kind of worked over. We had lots of thunder, thunderstorms last night across the south central Arizona deserts, including the Phoenix metro area and the Tucson metro area. So things were a little bit worked over. This was the 12Z sounding at Phoenix. You can see not all that bad, though. We still had a little bit of mixed layer cape to deal with, uh, but somewhat of an inversion in the low levels and very, very kind of a moist profile aloft. Tucson. Much of the same here, a little bit drier air, well aloft here, and not a whole lot of cape to deal with, a little bit of a low-level inversion. But we had heating throughout the day today that helped um, erode that cap pretty quickly, along with the influence of that trough, helped push out that contaminated air and get some of that destabilized air back in here. So um, that's going to kind of do it here. Just wanted to do a, a kind of a, a quick sort of briefing here on the overall setup. Very interesting setup. Of course, we don't see tornado warnings a lot in Arizona, but this was a kind of a classic sort of transition type event uh, where we get these nice weather systems, these troughs to move off the west coast, from off from the Pacific um, to act on leftover monsoon moisture. And when you have light, nice shear aloft, here we had nice uh, um, sort of 40 knots or so. Let me zoom in here, zoom into the southwest sector. You can see this was a couple hours ago, nice uh, 25, 30, 30 plus knots of shear here across um, the entirety of South Central Arizona there. Supercell composite here, just going back to our uh, notion about the left moving supercells here, you can see this is our left moving supercell composite. So basically it's our composite parameter diagnosing the potential for supercells and these are our left moving supercells. You can see there's a bullseye down there across South Central Arizona right where that storm was. If we look at our, our normal supercell composite, our kind of right moving supercell composite, not as strong of a signal. So definitely left moving supercells were going to be a, a player today for any isolated sort of storm, isolated supercell. Um, the left splits were gonna be able to take over and produce large hail and perhaps damaging winds. Um, so you can see nice shear across the deserts, the lower deserts here. And you, when you have that nice trough move in, this is a classic sort of transition type setup for Arizona. So that's how you get um, potent severe weather events and tornado warned supercells like this uh, in the desert. Uh, pretty interesting setup. So um, hope you learned something. Just wanted to do, a, to do a quick briefing on this storm as we don't often see this kind of weather in the desert southwest. So thanks for watching. We will see you in the next video.